Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Live number five. Boom! We've made it through. Well, we made it through four. We're gonna we're gonna see how we do today. Uh, there's a slim chance, but maybe you don't know who I am. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio, founder at Whistlekick. I'm a guy who loves martial arts, and uh, I produce a lot of content as part of my job here at Whistlekick, and this is one of the things that we do. Once a month, the first Tuesday of the month, we come at you live as an opportunity to engage, interact, and it's a lot of fun. What do we do at Whistlekick? Uh, we support the traditional martial arts. We support in as many ways as we can, and if you want to know more, you can go to whistlekick.com. This is this is what I do for podcasts, right? I have I have this this intro, and I'm I'm so you get to see behind the scenes. I show you how this all works. Uh, if you go to whistlekick.com, that's our online home, and it's where you learn about everything that we're doing. You got the store over there. If you use the code podcast fifteen, that'll save you fifteen percent off everything that we make. We got new shirts going in all the time. And actually, I'm going to show you. I saved this aside. Let's see if I can find it quickly enough. No, that's a that's a game I was playing. Uh, check out this shirt. This is one of the newer shirts that we did. Um, you can load any time. Apparently, I'm using all the bandwidth for this this thing that we're doing here. I'll show you that in a moment. But I don't know if I said use the code podcast fifteen save fifteen percent. Uh, martial arts radio. This show whistlekick martial arts radio dot com. We give you two episodes a week, and sometimes we do some extra stuff like this and why do we do what we do to connect educate entertain martial artists throughout the world there we go here's that shirt come on boom can you see this the delay is is has been reduced greatly this will be much more effective um so it's a crown yeah zooming in zooming in i think that works Come on, come on, Jeremy, slightly in the future. There we go. Cool. Uh, check that out. There's all kinds of stuff at whistlekick.com that you can check out. Uh, and don't forget the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you like what we do, please consider supporting us by a purchase or anything like that. So let's get into this stuff. Let's do it. I want to thank everybody who's joining us in the chat. Uh, all of your support, as always, is greatly appreciated. Highlights from episode four. We talked a lot last time about the martial artist handbook. Oh, let me show you the new cover. Stay right there. Don't go. See, there's so much going on with whistle kick that I forget how many whistle kick things are in my house. Boom. New cover. The martial artist handbook. We went past, we got past the collector's edition cover. Now we've got this fancy cover. It's the only change. So if you bought the collector's edition cover, uh, yes, you should buy this one too. I'm just kidding. If you want to, go for it. Uh, but there it is. And it's been selling well. That book has sold in five, six countries already. Reviews are, are great. I've been been loving it. So we talked about that last time. Um, thanks, Furnace. The other thing that we talked about last time that's worth bringing up is that myth that you have to register your hands as deadly weapons. And that started as a publicity stunt from boxer Joe Lewis, not kickboxer Joe Lewis, but Joe Lewis, the boxer. And he would bring the police to his pre-fight press conferences in order to intimidate his opponents by having the police register his hands as deadly weapons. And he was a professional fighter for 17 years from 34 to 51. Cool stuff. So one of the things that we want to do this time, let us know where you're listening from. I will shout you out, drop something in the chat now, later, I'll remind you, we're doing this for an hour. Some of you may pop in and out, but let me know where you're listening from. Um, so far, I think 100% of people in the chat have been guests on the show. So that's kind of cool. Um, what else? We're going to do that topic in a moment. I don't want to start with that. Uh, on the last episode, someone mentioned that they solved a Rubik's Cube as part of their testing, their rank testing. What's something non-martial arts related that you've been required to do for a rank test? Well, for me, the only thing that I've had to do that might be a little bit out of the ordinary is writing a paper. I had to write a paper for my green belt test. And I 
Okay, I have to write a paper. There was another one in there. Black belt test? Taekwondo black belt test? I think. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember. It's been a while. But that rings a bell. So I think I did that. I. Uh, what do we got? We got Gresham, Oregon. We got Keene, New Hampshire. Shout out to Andrew, who raced home from a class for this and hasn't even showered yet. I have mixed feelings on that, Andrew. Thank you for your support. Uh, Andrew, of course, was our guest on Martial Arts Radio. Great episode. Check that out. Uh, Renshi Craig in Waterville, Maine. We got, we got people. We got people in the chat. Good times. Uh, got Frank in there. I like the idea of, of testing, incorporating things that are a little bit beyond the things that happen in class. Why? Um, because I think proper martial arts training allows you to integrate your training into life. The way you approach certain things. So let's take the example of the Rubik's Cube. Let's say you've never tried to solve a Rubik's Cube. Maybe it's frustrating. What are you going to do in testing? Well, if you've been training a while, you're probably going to be more patient. You're probably going to approach it methodically. You will probably not throw it across the room. Uh, you might do something creative, like take the stickers off and rearrange them to solve it, which is the only way I've ever solved a Rubik's Cube. I like that creativity. Um, my original black belt test involved some martial arts weapons that I'd never even seen before. And I had to pick them up and figure them out. And because my martial arts education up to that point had been fairly broad, not nearly as broad as it has been today, but I was able to figure stuff out. Is it, you know, don't hold it by the blade. I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of common sense that goes on with weapons. Other than having to register your hands as deadly weapons, are there any other martial arts myths you're aware of? Um, the general public seems to think that martial arts involves a lot more kind of mystical stuff, meditation and, and attempts at levitating, things like that, than it actually does. Uh, I appreciate the synergy between meditation and martial arts, but based on my experience, most schools don't actually do it. I think that, you know, those Facebook memes that they're usually, what is it, six panels? And it's, you know, what my friends think I do, what the world thinks I do, what my parents think I do. And then, you know, that, that final one in the bottom right, what I actually do. I think a lot, I think we could really take a lot of truth from those. The world seems to think a lot of things about martial arts that are, very untrue. And it seems to vary dramatically from person to person. I don't see a lot of universal myths, but people tend to think that we're either far more violent than we are or um, far more regimented than we are. And there are violent schools and there are, or I should say uh, intense schools, is probably a better way to put it. Uh, and there are very regimented schools, but like anything else, the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. Gabe saying that his black belt test involved eating something gross, kimchi. I have seen black belt tests involve, at the end, uh, drinking sake or eating really hot peppers or um, what else? I think those are the, the extent of the food and gross. I've seen that in a few schools. The, the pepper I've only seen in one school, but the, the sake I've seen in a few. I find that really interesting. And I, you know, I don't know that it's bad that there are myths. If everybody knew exactly what was going on in martial arts, would they be as interesting? Would it have the mystique? I think the mystique probably keeps some people out, but I think it draws more people in. I think it's a net positive for us as an industry to not have everyone fully understand what we do. I think they've got the high points. I think overall people look at martial arts in a positive light. 
not everybody, but I think the majority of people have a mostly positive view of martial arts. And I think that's pretty good. I think that's what we want. Reggie Craig says, I just saw a video about the myth that you can't let your belt touch the floor. I was raised in karate that your belt does not touch the floor unless it is on you. Um, and I have seen that mirrored in other martial arts schools. I don't know if that's old Japanese tradition. I don't know where it comes from. Um, but I liked it as a tradition. Uh, maybe inconvenient when I started training, but I think it facilitated this really interesting duality in the way we look at our, our belts. You know, on the one hand, they are respected, revered, and you treat them with uh, a lot of um, there's a lot of value there. But on the flip side, you don't wash it, you don't clean it, you don't, it's the same thing. Uh, it gets frayed, it gets beat up, it gets bloody. I think what I like about that is that it's a true indicator of your time. Whatever you put into your training goes into your belt. The sweat, the spit, the blood, the time. And I think that's pretty great. And Gabe says, on the other hand, I've seen schools that place their belt on the floor to signify the end of each class. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. I've not participated in that. But myths are good. They keep us thinking. Gives us stuff to talk about, you know, when you find that other martial artist at a, at a party. You, got, you get a drink and you're in the back corner and you're comparing notes. Let everyone wonder. A couple things to mention in case you're not on the newsletter list. Uh, we did get a shipment of black and white sparring gear in. That's available at whistlekick.com. There is some on the road right now to Amazon. Grab that. Uh, and I showed you that shirt earlier. One thing that's happened since our last episode, all of the apparel at whistlekick.com, this is something we're doing moving forward. Everything is limited edition. It's not based on quantity, but it's based on time. So you can see the expiration date right there in the title. Once it's gone, it's gone. We might bring back similar things, but it will not be just like that ever again. So you should probably keep that in mind. Frank says they don't even use belts in Muay Thai. We all do it differently. And that's okay. And I, I, I like how discussion can arise and the sharing of ideas over the differences as long as we don't get so locked into those differences and um, tribalistic that we can't accept that somebody could do it, be doing something differently and it be just as okay, just as right, right. Did an episode of why there's no right way uh, as, as others. All right, so February, February is Black History Month. And so I've got a question here. Who are some of the most influential African-American martial artists? Um, so first off, I want to I wanna express why I struggle with, with this subject. Um, and not Black History Month, but any subject where we're creating division. On the one hand, I recognize that there is need to foster... Um, what the right word? There is a need to feature the accomplishments of groups of people because historically, not everyone has received equal treatment. My personal difficulty with that is that. I don't see groups of people in that, in that way. Um, it would be a really long conversation for me to kind of express where I come from and, and, and why I, I feel that way. Um, but in the end, I am reading this question. 
So I, I hope that that means something. So let's move on. Um, maybe I shouldn't have even said anything, but I did, and it's live. Can't take it back. So here's what we got for names. Now I've got a few, and there, we've already got some some names popping popping in here. Uh, Andrew saying Jim Kelly, absolutely, probably best known for being in Enter the Dragon. Uh, I had three names down here, people that I respected and looked up to. First one was Victor Moore, who somehow I was fortunate enough to talk to on episode 20 of Martial Arts Radio. It goes way, way back. And he told a very long story and uh, quite the narrative of his life and his time coming up as a martial artist at a point in U.S. history when I think the best anecdote that I took was him talking about being the defending champion at competitions and being made to use the back door of the, the gymnasium, which absolutely blew my mind. And then the other two names, uh, sadly, both have passed away, and despite recent attempts to get them on the show, it did not happen. Uh, Steve Nasty Anderson and Kevin Thompson, two names that I knew from my early days of competition people that I've, I've looked up to and respected for a long time and two men that their, their accomplishments absolutely speak for themselves. Phenomenal martial artists, phenomenal competition careers. Oh, Frenchy Sargent saying, since John Jenkins, um, which is a name all of you might not know, but uh, I certainly Excuse me, I've certainly heard that name and uh, I've heard some pretty impressive stories about Mr. Jenkins. I don't know that I ever met him. I don't think I did. One of the things that I like about martial arts radio is that we get to feature people from everywhere. Um, conducted an interview today and the guest in another country that we a country that we have not had a guest from this country yet. She is the first one. And I love that. And I love how we get to tell these stories. Rather, we're sharing the stories. People are telling their own stories. People from all over the world. And, you know, for me, martial arts is something that unifies us. It's something that brings us together. It doesn't matter whether you're from... Saudi Arabia or Brazil or Canada or Australia. The body moves in the same ways. Shotokan karate in, in one of those countries is going to be pretty darn close to Shotokan karate in, other, in, in one of the others. One of the reasons that Olympic Taekwondo has spread so effectively is that, you know, there was a concerted effort from the Korean government to spread it globally. And that's why it's in the Olympics and you can make all the commentary you want, but it is in the Olympics and it is something that is partic participated. It's something that people participate in, to my knowledge, just about, if not every country on earth. And I think that's really cool. There's martial arts everywhere. And I love that. It's something that makes me really happy. Here's a good one. How does being in an actual street fight change the way you train, teach, or your view of either? I'm going to have to speculate. One of my proudest accomplishments is having defused every almost fight that's arisen. I'm 40 years old. I have never been in what I would term a real fight. Have there been exchanges? Yes. Have there been almost? Quite a few. But I'm proud that I haven't had to go there. Does that mean I'm a great person to teach self-defense? No. But I think it means I'm a pretty good person to teach you how to not get in a fight. I think that experience speaks for itself. But when we talk about how real-life combat impacts the way we view martial arts, it's, it's a conversation that's going on a lot right now. There are quite a few people who are advocating for separate curriculums around self-defense, separate conversations. And I agree. 
I agree it's something that needs to be handled a little bit differently because while self-defense can be martial arts and while martial arts can be self-defense, they're not necessarily the same thing. I can teach you self-defense without having ever taught you martial arts. I can also teach you martial arts without ever having taught you self-defense. I feel that a good martial arts curriculum includes a real self-defense curriculum. I think that's important. But if the school does not include that, I'm not going to say that they're wrong. Because, well, we're not going to get into the because. I've talked about that a bit uh, in the past. And I don't like rehashing things too often. But I think the number one thing that we're finally starting to talk about, and it's been a long time, is discussing the psychology. The psychology of everything that leads up to that first punch, whether it's a punch or not. The, the psychology of what's effectively being a bully or um, substance altered perspective, you know, when someone's drunk or whatever. There's a lot to talk about there. And my advice to anyone who cares, it's the same advice I've always had. Observe people. Go to places and observe people. Go to a place, go to a bar and bring a couple friends and sit in the corner and observe. Watch the way people conduct themselves. The better you understand people, the better you're going to be prepared. The better you're able to draw correlations and make educated guesses on how people work and the better you can bring that into any kind of martial arts or self-defense curriculum. I think that there are um, what do I want to call it? There are elements that you can bring in. Gabe's saying verbal self-defense is just as important as the physical. Uh, I would say it's more important. But I thought this would be, I don't think I've done this on, on this show or any show. I'm going to show you. Here are the things I carry in my pocket all the time. I have a knife. Uh, this is my favorite knife of the moment. It's a Kershaw Leak, half serrated. Uh, keep it pretty darn sharp. And this stays in my pocket. The knife's really useful. I use this thing almost every day. I've never stabbed anyone with this. I've never, I've never pulled out any of my knives in a potential uh, self-defense need. But I know it's there if I need it. Have I trained with it extensively? No. Have I trained with it a little bit? Barely. But I'd rather have it than not have it. Now, here are the other two things that I carry. And this is something that I don't hear too many people talking about. So the first thing this is a flashlight, you know, just a little five, six dollar thing I picked up on Amazon. It's metal. Um, it's pretty bright. It takes a AAA battery. And I use this several times per week. Walking to the car. You know, when I close up coaching CrossFit, having this light is really handy. Better than having my phone and trying to, to use that because sometimes I've got gloves on and don't want to drop my phone. But what I also like about it is that it's metal and I can hold this and I can, I can use this as a weapon. I can bang somebody in the head with it and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt more than if I hit them with my, my hand. The other thing, and I'll tell you what these two things have in common in a moment, uh, it's a space pen. So just a decent, cheap uh, metal pen. It's just a pen. I use this several times a week because it's a pen. It's a pen in my pocket. And I can, I can scribble, I can write. In theory, I can write when it's wet and upside down because it's a space pen. I've never tried that. Maybe I should. But here's what I like about these two things. Cannot bring on a plane. Can bring on a plane. These are not weapons. They are not sold as weapons. Uh, I can deploy them as weapons. 
and I like having them. What's the other one? I don't have it on me right now. Uh, a belt. I can deploy that belt at any time. And the reason I bring these things up as we're talking about actual street fight and these ideas of, of real life combat. If your life is at risk, if your well-being is at risk, you do what you have to do and you use what you have at your disposal. Whether that's a belt or a shoe or a water bottle or a stick or your three-year-old son. Yes, I was deployed as a weapon against a goose once. That I'm not even close to making that up. Very traumatic experience for me. You do what you got to do, right? But having things available to you that you know you can deploy if need be, I think that's pretty important. Have I trained with my belt? Yeah. Because it's the thing that I feel... I tell you what, you have this knife... I will use my belt. We'll see which one of us comes out on top. Maybe you've got a lot more experience with your knife, but that belt with a big heavy buckle and this much extra range, I'll take that. I'll take that every time. A couple comments coming in. Uh, great knife, and these items would make a great coubaton. Yes. So if you're not familiar with a coubaton, the idea that you can strike or, you know, Joint manipulations you get as a lever point, right? Good stuff there. I'm not saying you should carry any of these things. I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying you should think about it. And it should be a choice. I choose to or I choose not to. It shouldn't be an accident. What's the difference between training for self-defense and dealing with bullies? How are they the same or different? Um, there's a lot of similarities. Self-defense usually involves bullies who were not checked as children and grew up to continue to be bullies. Uh, unfortunately, I deal with bullies periodically. There are people in my life that are in and out of martial arts who are bullies. And uh, I won't lie, there are nights I lie in bed and dream about punching them in the throat. I don't want to, but it's how I process that frustration. Um, how does that change what we teach? Depends on the circumstances, right? And, and, and this is one of the, I think, difficult parts in teaching self-defense, in teaching martial arts, is that how to handle certain situations isn't something you can just come up with a simple decision tree for. If the bully says this, then you have to punch them in the throat. But if the bully says this, then you walk away. It's not that easy. And the longer you get training with someone, the more time you have with them, the easier it is to teach them, the better it is to help them understand. But at the end of the day, that person has to make the decision for themselves. I think the difference between someone being a bully in the traditional definition and someone bringing a situation to a true self-defense scenario is about intent. A bully, a bully's intent is to assert themselves over you using the minimal amount of force necessary to make themselves feel better. If you escalate things, they will escalate with you. But if you back down, it's probably not going to be too bad. But a self-defense situation is when the intent exceeds what is necessary to express that assertion, that dominance over someone. The bully makes verbal threats, the self-defense is assault from moment one. Is that over, overly simplified? Yes. But it's my show, so I get to overly simplify it if I want to. Um, but that, 
there's there's no easy way to define it, right? Like, I, we could we could have dictionary definitions of self defense. We could do surveys. We could talk to people. We could talk about bullying and how it relates to self defense. But there there's a lot of overlap, and there are situations that are one and not the other, and it's really hard to define them. But we could probably all sit there and say that's bullying, that's self defense, and we'd probably agree on eighty percent of it. Training for those two situations? Because that was the heart of the question. What's the difference between training for self-defense and dealing with bullies? Training for self-defense requires a suspension of logic. So I said earlier, I'm really proud. I have been able to de-escalate everything that's come at me. I would thus define everything I've experienced as some form of bullying. If someone actually intended on harming me, it is less likely, not completely unlikely, not impossible, but far less likely that I'm going to be able to diffuse that simply with words. And when you train for self-defense, you have to be ready for that rapid escalation, that coming out of left field, punch to the face, that you might not know why it's coming because there might not be a reason. Violence isn't always logical. Life isn't always logical. So we prepare, right? And these are things that we instinctively do quite often. Some of us are trained to do these things. But the best example, the cliche example is the sitting with your back to the wall in a restaurant watching the door. You know, the sheepdog idea. That was just page one. We're a half hour in. Man, a lot going on here. If you were attacked right now, and this goes for everybody watching or listening, wherever you are, what's the closest thing you can grab to defend yourself? Well, what do I have? I have this pen. It feels like cheating because I have these things. Uh, if I was not showing them to you, they would not have been on my desk, uh, this table, makeshift desk. So I would have a pen, I would have some paper, I would have this book. Here, we'll put the book over there. That was loud. I would have this clipboard. I would probably prefer this clipboard over the pen only because of range um, and because it's different enough that it's going to confuse people. If someone punches at me with this, uh, it's prob I mean, it's, it's a cheap clipboard, right? It's gonna break. Um, but it's gonna throw people off. Okay, come at me. I've got a clipboard. That might confuse them enough that it might give me a few second advantage. What else is within range? There's a whole desk of weapons and scissors that I can't reach, so clearly that wouldn't do it. I could, I could also um, do something with this plant hanger. You can see some of the plants on this shelving unit. Um, a boot. Oh, here we go. Some uh, some weighted training gloves. I could punch someone in the face with that, although I probably wouldn't have time to put them on. I like playing that game. Not the what would you do if game, because I, I, I think sometimes people take that a little too far, but how would you use this as a weapon game? That's a lot of fun. I've done that in my Kempo Jiu-Jitsu class. We... We've done everything from rolled up newspapers and water bottles and what else have we used? We definitely use belts, sneakers. And I'll tell you what, I would take almost anything over nothing. I can't think of anything that would be worse than nothing. Even this, I'm not going to unplug it because it's charging the phone right now, but this, this cable. This cable, it's like six feet long. I would take that. Because you're going to be a little distracted if I'm trying to whip you in the face with a USB cable. It's not going to feel good. So play that game. You know, if you, if you live with a martial artist, uh, or maybe you do a self-defense night, and you say, you know what? Everybody, go to your pants pockets. 
and take everything out. Or go to your jacket pocket. You know, go get your gloves. Go out to the car. What are the weirdest things that we can experiment with right now? It's okay to experiment. Uh, what's, what's nearby that might be weird and different that people have not trained with? I'm looking around my kitchen. There's a plant stand. Garbage can. How about a garbage can? I've never done any self-defense involving a garbage can. I'm going to guess every martial arts school has a garbage can. Take the bag out. How would you defend yourself with that? The more you're thinking about this stuff, the, the more involving your mind. The more you are involving your mind. There, words matter. And that makes you a better martial artist. Being able to take your training and apply it and, and think through it, I think is really important and really relevant. <laughs> Renty Craig says, the metal pot behind you could do some damage. Absolutely. This is a, uh, that's a heavy aluminum pot that I use on the wood stove to just put some water vapor back into the air. But that would absolutely mess your face up if I hit you with it. That it I have no idea how old that thing is. It is not, it's probably an antique. I don't fully know the history of it. Uh, but yeah, that would that would do a number on you. Laptop cord, Frank says. Laptop cord would probably do something. Um, <laughs> Gabe says, my three-year-old son, jar of animal cookies. Yeah, I mean, all perfectly acceptable options. You do what you got to do. Here's something. Speaking of, of young children. This, I, I don't know that we've ever posted this on any whistle kick stuff. This this is on, is it on this one? Nope. I gotta stop throwing that. It's making loud noises. But uh, this is me, um, not 100% sure when, but based on a few things in the picture, roughly age six or seven. Don't, should not be as old as eight, made as the absolute oldest is eight. Youngest would be six. So somewhere in there. And uh, I keep this around to remind me that I've been doing it. I've been doing it for a while and I've come a long way. And also that I used to have a lot of hair. And I do not have any anymore. When you're performing a form... Does it help you to think about what the movements mean in Japanese bunkai or just what the movements are? There are layers to forms. Uh, first, it's, and, and I suggest it being taught in this way. First, you got to do the moves. You got to roughly get them down. You have to have enough of a foundation to be able to correct it. And I see people teaching forms and they go way too deep and you get four moves in and you're trying to give people all this depth on the movement and they don't have anywhere close to the experience to understand what you're saying. How about you start with them being able to do the pattern? And that, I take that term from, uh, from Taekwondo. It, they're often called patterns. Yeah, it's a sequence of movements. How about we start with this prearranged thing and let's give the person the victory of being able to remember it and then let's start refining the movements. Let's teach them what the movements are at that point. You are blocking here. You are punching here. And then let's talk about the application and how that might work out. Understanding how a bunch of movements could work without being able to remember them is kind of silly. There's an order that has to be followed. So follow the order. And recognize that not everybody cares about application. That's okay. Maybe it's part of curriculum that you have to understand some of that or maybe even memorize some of that. But like everything else in martial arts, there are aspects that we're going to really like and there are going to be things that we really don't like. That's okay. Ooh, Andrew has drumsticks nearby. Drumsticks would be great. Uh, in fact, Andrew, if you are not training with your drumsticks as a martial arts weapon, I'm going to say that you're wrong. Uh, if you haven't listened to, is it really just yesterday that aired? Uh, yesterday's episode with, with Mr. Adams. Uh, you should. Drumming is a big part of his life. And we actually talked about the intersection between drumming and rhythm, music, and martial arts. And it was a fun conversation. When I'm doing a form, 
I'm thinking about it in different ways depending on what I'm working on. There are times when I'm working on remembering the movements or making an adjustment to some of those movements. I'm not thinking about application during that time. It is silly for me to focus on application when the priority is I keep screwing up the stance and I got to get this stance right. It's like everything else. In martial arts, you've got your foundation, your basics. The basics of a form is the basic of a form is being able to do the movements in the right order, more or less, right? And then from there, it's an understanding of what those movements are, and then it's an understanding of how you would apply those movements. Are there times that I train thinking a lot about application? Yes, and I think that's really fun. I love thinking about that. You give me any form that I know and tell us, Give me a bunch of people and I will figure out a way to apply it and I will learn a ton about that form. I think that's so great. And I love Bunkai application being done in a free form way once you reach higher ranks. Uh, the idea that there's only one way to apply it is silly. I disagree with that strongly. And if your school teaches that there's only one right way to interpret that form for application, I think that's sad because you're robbing students the opportunity of figuring things out for themselves because when it comes time for them to teach or when it comes time for them to defend themselves if all they know how to do is parrot back what their instructor has taught them they are not going to be in as good of a position next oh um so there's a great example and if you've never seen this movie this is a good movie and this is my favorite thing about this movie um michael j white Never back down, no surrender. Uh, Michael Dwight White. I'm going to possibly butcher this name. Ion, Eon, O'Brien. And the movie does cut back and forth between Michael Dwight White doing his form and then showing the application of those movements. It's super cool. Um, if you're at all a, a forms nerd, you'll probably dig that if you've not seen it. And you can search the effectiveness of traditional karate on YouTube to find that fight scene. Yeah, good times. Good stuff. If we could have a martial arts-themed halftime show at the Super Bowl, who or what would you want to see? And my suggestion, it's weird to be quoted in a list of notes that I have for a show that I'm doing, uh, but I commented that the most of you have probably seen that, uh, it was a few months ago, the very high-flying Taekwondo demo. I mean, they were doing some crazy cool stuff. I think there was breaking involved. I just remember the like uh, cheerleading-esque throws and jumps that were really cool. I think it would have to be based around that. And Daniel Eagle says it would have to be something like this. Nothing else is flashy enough. I think we could really have something pretty cool there. And I hope that martial arts demo teams will continue to push those boundaries because the more of that we get, the more it's going to be featured in mainstream media, the more it'll bring people into martial arts, and we can repeat that cycle. It doesn't just have to be a forms application. There's so many ways to apply martial arts. None of them are wrong, and I will fight for that. CJ Mayo, WKF style team forms with the application, the Bunkai, that would show both the gracefulness and the action that people would attract to. Then add in the high flying Taekwondo and some throws of judo and all. And I could see that. Um, I think there's a way to do application that would be really neat. In fact, I could imagine, imagine you have team forms, which I often see as three people doing the form. And then you essentially have three groups doing the application. So three sets of attackers, three sets of people doing the form, showing the application, and then showing that synchronicity. I think that would be really, really cool because you'd be you know, dumping bodies, hopefully in the same way, and, and the falls and everything would be synchronized. That'd be really neat. Andrew, one of the things I loved about the Olympic ceremony in Beijing was the incredible timing done by hundreds of people at the same time. Yes, that was phenomenal. If you haven't checked that out, do it. It wasn't martial arts related per se, but watching people in perfect sync is impressive. To that end, a huge group of people all doing kata together, like perfectly together, 
that would be impressive. I enjoy watching people do forms together. The more people you have doing them together that are in lockstep, it becomes exponentially more impressive. Two people are great. Three is better. Five, if you watch five people perfectly doing a form together, blows my mind. I don't know if non-practitioners understand how much time goes into that, but I absolutely love it. One of my favorite things. So here's a fun story. Um, we'll get to that. Oh, I'll ask you now. What is a snowman's favorite drink? Frank, our resident jokester. Mm, Frosty. Frosty from Wendy's? A Wendy's Frosty? That's my guess. I'll tell the story in a minute. Let's see what, what Frank's answer is. Uh, any other answers there? Nope. That was the extent of, of the halftime show question. And if you didn't watch the Super Bowl, you missed a wonderful comeback. I did not really have a preference for either team. I grew up as a 49ers fan, but I haven't really followed football intensely. And a few years ago, I decided that the Patriots needed to be my team because I have lived in New England my entire life. And I need one New England team that I like uh, because the Celtics and the Red Sox are not my teams. And uh, the Bruins are not because I don't really follow hockey. <laughs> the answer, what is a snowman's favorite drink? Iced tea. Yes. Good stuff. Um, so here's a, here's a fun story. So you might have caught a couple months ago, a few months ago, maybe even over the summer, I interviewed my original karate, one of my original karate instructors, Shihan Bakhbila. We went 20 years without doing any forms together. And the forms are her thing. Forms have always been my thing. Love them tremendously. And when it came to forms, I was probably, you know, I don't know what anybody would describe me in that way, but I, I always kind of saw myself as, hey, looks like we're back. I have no idea where we're at. We'll see what the delay is. I'm going to wave my hand and we'll see how long it takes for that to show up. Oh, we skipped some things. It's really blurry. Internet got really bad. Looks like it buffered. Okay, and we're back. Cool. So, uh, I don't know what's going on with that. You know, guys, I live in the woods. I live three miles up dirt roads, plural. Um, this is what we got. I do the best I can. And uh, thanks for your patience. So you may have missed that story, but at the same time, based on what I just saw, I'm guessing it did come through. So I'm not going to tell it again. And if you missed it, then you missed it. All right. Whew. Got some good stuff. We're going to end on 10 minutes. I would like to say a couple things as, as we get into the last block of the show. I feel like I'm doing a better job with this material. Gabe is doing a significantly better job. I'm going to change that wording because it sounds like he was doing a bad job. Gabe continues to improve on the type of content that, that I do best with. Um, so shout out to him for just killing it. I, I've, got, I've got more than enough material. With what I have here on this last page, I could probably stretch another 20 to 30 minutes. So nice job, Gabe. And if we have stuff left over, we'll use it next month. What was a light bulb moment for you in your training? And for those of you watching. I would love to hear this from you. <sighs> Light bulb moment. I'm, I'm very quickly scanning through the years. Um, there were a few. The first one I'm thinking of is in sparring, the idea that I could take a step without throwing a kick. That I could just have footwork and I didn't have to kick it every time I wanted to change position um that was pretty pretty big another one was that movement how do i express this 
movement didn't have to be a block or a punch. It could be a setup or a f- think of like a fake, but it isn't necessarily that. So in 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 Kempo, the idea of this knocking the hand away before you block it to get it offline, right? Um, I really like that. That was that was a, a eye opener for me. And I think the third one was as I started to understand that you don't have to look that hard at technique to find biomechanical advantages. And that if you understand the human body and how it works, it can help you get into better position that is not counter to traditional technique, but actually better traditional technique. And in some aspects, it's things that we've kind of, uh, in some schools, have kind of forgotten. And the best example I'll give of, of, of that is um, the idea of a vertical punch. You know, so people talk about, you know, why would I do this versus this? And there, there's some arguments there. But I'll tell you what, if you take that punch and you drop it down a little bit and you can use your, your lat muscles, bam, and punch and maybe that hand even turn slightly to get a little more recruitment there, incredibly powerful. And I've played with punching heavy bags with this stuff. And I think that's the, one of the best values of, of bags is you can start to experiment with positions. But there's three. There's three kind of eye openers for me over the years. What percentage of material should be taught before and after black belt? That depends on so many things. It depends on how much material there is. It depends on the relative difficulty of the material. I've known schools that teach everything before black belt, that there is nothing after black belt that is new. It's just further refinement. I've also known schools where there's so much material that you get roughly half of it before black belt. Depends. It depends on the philosophy of the school. Depends on so many other things. I don't have a overall preference. I will say there are some schools that have so much material that it can be difficult to really fully understand it because you spend so much time learning new material that it doesn't give you the opportunity to go back and uh, really delve deep into older material. Uh, some programs start weapons early, some after black belt, some not at all. What's your take on weapons in an empty hand style? Weapons enhance your understanding of empty hand technique. Example. I don't have a, I don't have a stick anywhere. I can't really show you a bow. All right. So take a bow and I've seen all kinds of different ways, different styles of using a staff. So I'm not going to say there's a right way or a wrong way, but try striking with any kind of power without balancing forward action and retraction. doesn't work. You end up with a weird thing like this or a weird thing like this. If you have a hard time understanding that when you punch, you retract that hand using a, a staff, will help you understand that concept. Um, if you know Tunfa, I don't, where, are, where are they? I think mine are in the closet. Um, if you are someone who has terrible high blocks or rising blocks, agiyuki, whatever you call it, you hold a Tunfa, which is, looks like a nightstick for those of you that might not know. Um, you know, the handle's here. And then you've got block of wood here. Strike comes down, bam. Right? You're going to hit on the stick. If you're someone who does this, or maybe your hand goes out here, ah. Right? Uh, one of the jokes I make when I teach kids is, what part of your head do you block on a high block? Part of your head that you want to keep. I think weapons are great. Um, 
I grew up with bow being the first weapon in our curriculum. If I had the chance to redesign a martial arts curriculum, I would probably take a single stick rather than, than a staff as the first weapon because it is the easiest thing to pick up. I can take, um, I can take a sneaker and the concepts that are going to be useful in a single stick will apply to that sneaker or that knife or that clipboard. And so the applicability, I think, is, is pretty good stuff. How much can a person really learn from online instruction? I want to save that for next time because I want to go deep on that because I, that is a nuanced conversation and I don't want to do it in two minutes. Do public demos really help spread the message of the martial arts? Is there a better way to attract? You know what? Let's save both of those because I'm looking at two minutes left on the clock. And uh, so, Gabe, we're going to save both of those for episode six. And let's... Let's close up. Let, let me give you a couple things. And in First Cup tradition, so those of you who don't watch First Cup, uh, week, every weekday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern, only on YouTube, uh, I give homework. And so I'm going to give a little bit of homework. But what I do is I do that as the very last thing. So you... I just dropped a picture of me on the floor. It's awfully foreboding don't know how it fell. It really was fully on the table. Um, but in the tradition of First Cup, I'm going to give you homework in a minute, and you're going to listen to my outro, and we're going to go from there. All right. Um, we do this show, Martial Arts Radio, Mondays and Thursdays. I would love to get um, a few more guest suggestions. We've got a lot of people in the mix. Some of those people are, are proving to be a little more difficult to book. So if you... Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com or fill out. I think there's, I think the form is still up on the website. Anyway, get to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com with your guest suggestions. I will pass those over to Lessie. Shout out to Lessie, who is killing it on the back end of this show. I love the guests that we're getting. Absolutely phenomenal. But I just, I want to build up our buffer. Our buffer is not quite where it could be. Uh, so I'd love some help for that. Thursdays. Thursday shows are all over the place. What are they? They're not interviews. And if you have feedback for a topic or something like that, I want to hear it. You know, we're going to take the audio from this. This will be out in the, in the feed. So maybe you're listening to this later on. Hey, if you like it, cool. If you want to have some say over future episodes, I want to hear it. It is important to me that everything about Whistlekick has input from our community. Um, I've got my fancy sheets. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, sign up for the newsletter, find everything that's going on. Whistlekick.com for shirts, uh, podcast 15 to save 15%. And if you want to help us out beyond or instead of making a purchase, you got a few ways. Share an episode, follow us on social media, repost something, tell a friend. Or support the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you spend five bucks a month, you get even more stuff. We give you almost everything for free. There's a little bit that if you contribute, we'll give you more. So keep that in mind. And all right, homework. So here's homework. We talked a lot today about weapons and self-defense. We talked about what was in pockets. We talked about how to think about self-defense and curriculum and things like that over the next this would be the ideal thing take your phone and set an alarm for every we'll say two hours tomorrow you know obviously waking hours and whenever that alarm goes off you have to stop and look around you and if something went down, if there was a real scenario, what would you use? How would you get yourself an advantage in terms of terrain or, you know, location, weapons? How can you exit? All of it. I want you to think about that. So there's your homework. And if you do your homework, I want to hear about it. I want to hear what you do. I got to go to bed because I got to get up and do another show tomorrow morning. 
because first cup, I think we're coming up on two years of five plus days a week. Because I used to do it seven days a week in the beginning. I want to thank you for coming by. This show is a lot of fun for me. I enjoy the interaction uh, and, and the engagement with all of you. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a good night.